Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thanks, Jeff. Um, so today what I want to do is just show uh, kind of a real basic couple of tests that you can do to a platinum resistance thermometer to determine if it's working correctly. Um, but before we get into some of that, I want to just go through some terminology that we might be using, um, kind of the difference between calibration and a verification. And then other questions that I get asked frequently is, how often should I be doing this test and and um, what are all the factors that go into determining that frequency of, of check? Um, kind of a, a typical application, I had a call the other day from a company that had a had an RTD installed in, in some process and it had been there for several years. They had never checked it. And all of a sudden one day it started giving some erratic readings. So they pulled it out and then started asking questions about it and then, you know, well, how long has it been bad? You know, they really don't know what's that been doing to their process. Have they covered up that inaccurate temperature measurement with some other setting within the process? You know, so it's really important to do a periodic check on uh, RTDs, they, they, they can drift over time a little bit depending on how they're being used and the temperature that they're in. Um, and, it, and by ensuring that you do have that accurate temperature measurement, you're going to have efficient use of your energy dollars. It's going to help with consistent product quality. Uh, you know, so there's just a couple of reasons for kind of maintaining uh, the accuracy of your temperature measurement points. Um, these are just some of the some of the little jargon and lingo that uh, that we run into when we talk about calibration or verification of RTDs. And the ones that we'll probably hear the most today are R0 or resistance at zero degrees C, and then a doer, just an insulated container that we use for ice baths, and then the insulation resistance and um, I guess most of the, you know, you'll hear it as, as IR, sometimes it's written I sub IR, but um, that's a, one of the most important checks that most people don't do to RTDs, and I want to show why that is important today. So there's a couple of different things we can do to RTDs. One is a calibration, the other is a verification. The verification is what I'm going to demonstrate today, and the uh, calibration is something that would be done typically in a laboratory, covers several temperature measurement points, and it characterizes the exact resistance of the of that particular temperature probe over a wide temperature range. And we'll do this to um, either match it to a uh, transmitter or to a control system, and we can eliminate a lot of the temperature probe interchangeability that way and get a more accurate uh, system accuracy. Uh, when we're doing a verification, what we're, what we're doing is just checking the probe, typically at zero degrees C, just to see if it still falls within the two um, RTD standards, either the ASTM 1137 or the IEC um, 60751. And they have, um, you know, you've probably heard the uh, the different tolerance bands there. There's a class A and a class B. And I think they're um, adding a class C and maybe even a class AA now. <coughs> so we're just going to, we just want to show how we can verify that the RTD is, is still meeting those um, original specifications. So, and, and why we're doing this, um, just to kind of repeat myself a little bit here because this is important, um, especially with the efficient use of energy. And um, we just need to make sure that we maintain that measurement accuracy to get your good, consistent product quality. And then a lot of us have uh, third party people looking over your shoulder to make sure that you're doing all this stuff correctly. And that, uh, you know, when they say your, when you say your freezer's at minus, 80 degrees C that it is actually 80 degrees C and you can prove it to that uh, third party um, auditor. I 
And just a little example here of of the amount of money that can can be involved in poor accuracy. Um, you know, if we're heating water in this example, just one degree too much, um, you know, eighteen hundred dollars a year. That's uh, um, kind of lets you know that you probably should um, spend a little money on the uh, calibration or verification of the part periodically, and then also to purchase and install a good, accurate measurement system in the first place, because it really does pay off in the long run. So um, one of the big questions is with frequency. I, and this is something that, um, you know, the, the RTD manufacturers cannot really uh, tell you what it is. There, there is no standard six months or a year or whatever. It's all based on the, the uh, process and the characteristics of how the probe is being used. You know, we have some customers that will check the calibration or, or verify the RTD performance before and after a batch process. So they'll run it through a full calibration before, run the batch, run it again after that, just to make sure that what was going on during that process remained accurate, that temperature measurement remained accurate. Um, other, you know, kind of on the other end of the scale where it's a, a process that might be running continuously, it may not have, um, you know, that, that batch process importance to it. it. It may start out at six months, and uh, if you go through, like, five cycles like that and don't see any shifting, well, then you can double that to a 12-month period. Um, and, and really kind of what it boils down to is you just have to take a bit of an educated guess as to what the correct frequency is for that calibration. And there's a few factors that come into play here that, that can help, um, help you make that educated guess. Um, one is the probe drift. Now, the, the manufacturers will have some published numbers for drift of an RTD, and those can be, oh, um, you know, maybe 0.3 degrees C per year uh, would be kind of a, a typical number for one that's used at a high temperature, you know, four or 500 degrees C. Uh, the lower temperatures, the, the probes don't drift as quickly, and then it's going to be down on the 0, 0.0 something degrees C per year. So if you have a process that requires real high accuracy and it's running at 100 degrees C, um, you know, you, you may want to still consider that drift into your um, estimate of calibration frequency. The, you know, on the other hand, if it's something where you're just looking for, you know, plus or minus a half a degree or maybe a degree C, that you probably don't need to take that into consideration. Some of the other things that will cause a probe to drift quickly are temperature cycling, and then if it sees any any uh, high vibration or shock, and, and shock can be from, oh, like a water hammer, that uh, if you have a uh, steam injecting into a, uh, a liquid line, sometimes that can cause enough of a, a, a pulse to, to uh, cause that temperature probe to shift slightly. And, and so all of these things um, kind of take into account and Try to come up with your, your best guesstimate as to what a good frequency of calibration or verification is. In other situations where we have product that may be, oh, it might be real sticky or it might um, have some particles in it that will erode the probe or the thermal well, you might want to pull those out more frequently and check those because uh, product buildup on the outside of the probe can slow down the time response. Uh, it can also insulate the probe from the process temperature. And then you're going to see more stem conduction, and you're going to be reading more of the ambient air conditions rather than your product temperature. So 
a, a few different factors there to look at in trying to determine what the correct frequency of calibration or verification is. And you know, and, and, and with this, this product buildup or erosion or e corrosion, you know, it, it's not always the performance of the probe, it's, it's the, uh, the, um, the environment that it's placed into. And kind of the bottom line here is that, you know, you really need to, to set the frequency so that it really meets your level of confidence in that temperature measurement. And the probe manufacturers can help you with, with probe performance, um, some of the long-term uh, uh, drift stability and repeatability type numbers. Um, but the end user really is the expert on the process and knowing what's going on in the process and, and things that may affect that temperature measurement. One thing that can help is to group together a whole bunch of similar temperature points so when you're collecting all this data, you, you get a, a larger data set and it, and it will help you make a little better estimation of what a good frequency of verification is. The um, other situations where you, you may have a, a third party that may say, well, I want to see that you do this every six months or it's minimum a one-year time, you know, and, and that may be what governs the frequency of your uh, calibration cycles. And again, like I already mentioned, if we can get through five calibration cycles without the probe shifting significantly, then you can go ahead and double that interval and, and keep track of the, the, the data then. And, you know, if you go through another five cycles, then you could double it again. So it's a bit of an iterative, 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 iterative process, and there is no, um, you know, good rule of thumb or any hard and fast rule that says calibrate at this frequently. It just really depends on the process and how the probe is being used. Mm -hmm.